Okay, Matthew. Uh, thanks for having me, uh, inviting me to come talk. Um, so I wanna talk basically about one, the whole talk's gonna be about one question essentially and one theorem. Um, and so we're gonna dig into the ideas of the proof, I think, because I think that's really the interesting thing. So the question is, suppose you've got some string, um, you know, some maybe quite large length, and it's somewhat random. So maybe like a quarter random. So it's not like a totally random string, but there's some amount of randomness in it. And the question is, can you somehow shrink it down to a smaller string, shorter than the original one, which is maybe half random, right? So you wanna increase the amount of randomness of the string, but at the same time, decreasing the length. Um, intuitively, there, there's sort of only a certain amount of randomness. So if you wanna boost the sort of percentage randomness, you're gonna to have to decrease the length. Um, so this, it turns out, or we have to add some, some reasonable rules, right? Um, so like the procedure that does the shrinking should be effective in some way, right? It shouldn't just be that you get to arbitrarily assign strings to some other string. So do you want to effectively shrink things? And you want the procedure to work on every string that's, let's say one quarter random. So it's, it's a machine that takes any one quarter random string and boosts the randomness by, by making it smaller. The other thing is that the output strings, you don't want to just have like all the output strings of length two or something. You want bigger and bigger output strings. So you want to say for every size of output string M, there should be some number N so that strings of length N, big length, get turned to strings of length M, the smaller length. So the output strings should be of, of larger and larger sizes as the input strings get larger and larger. So those are sort of the, the reasonable rules to, to make it like an actual question that's actually useful. Uh, and the answer turns out to be no. So you can't figure out, you can't shrink strings and, and increase the randomness. But you could ask me instead, suppose if I take this big string, which is a quarter random, and I'm gonna shrink it not just to one string, but I'm gonna produce multiple smaller strings. And all I'm gonna ask is that at least one of those is more random, so half random, say. Um, and I don't have to know which of them is gonna be more random, but but I have to guarantee that one of those smaller strings is gonna be more random. And it turns out for this, the answer is yes. Um, depending on, it has to be the right number of output strings, depending on how much you wanna increase the randomness. Uh, so the more strings you have, basically the more you're gonna be able to increase the randomness. So in the talk, uh, basically I'm gonna explain why this is. Uh, we're gonna say, how big does K have to be to get a certain increase in randomness? Um, but really, um, I guess I don't know how many people in the audience already know about Kolmogorov complexity and randomness, but we're going to sort of do an introduction to that. Um, and the proof passes through a really cool connection with, with the question of pure graph theory. So we're going to see how this, this question about computability and randomness is directly connected with something from, from graph theory. Um, and I should say this is all joint work with uh, Laurent Bienvenu and Barbara Chima. So general outline, so first of all, we'll talk about Kolmogorov complexity. We'll, we'll do the basic definitions and we'll get an idea of how that works. Um, then second, we'll, we'll uh, sort of state the main theorems, which are about these things called Kolmogorov extractors. Third, we'll talk about how you get the connection with graphs. And then finally, we'll talk about how, how to look at the graph theoretic problem. So that's sort of the, the outline. So to start with, we'll, we'll define Kolmogorov complexity. Um, which is essentially, what do we mean when I say that string is a quarter random or half random? What do I mean by that? So the, the informal definition, so the, the Kolmogorov complexity of a string informally is the shortest description of that string, the length of the shortest description. So it's basically like, what is the, the information content of that string? So if I had a string that was like zero, 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 just all zeros, but very, very long, it still doesn't actually have that much information in it, right? Because I can describe it by saying, you know, it's, it's a million zeros. That's a very short description of a very, very long string. So that very, very long string would still have very short, very small Kolmogorov complexity. On the other hand, if I had a string that was just like randomly zeros and ones, um, there'd be no real description of it other than just listing out the zeros and ones. So that would have very high Kolmogorov complexity. So that's the informal ideas. Uh, strings basically have shorter descriptions than the actual string itself. More formally, we have to say, okay, what's, how, how are we like interpreting this description? So uh, if M is a Turing machine, which takes finite strings as inputs and outputs. Uh, think of M as like turning a description into a string. So it interprets a description and figures out what string is describing. And then you say that the, the Kolmogorov complexity using this machine of a string is the minimal length of the description of sigma, right? So when we say 
uh, m of tau equals sigma, that's really saying that according to the machine m, tau is a description of sigma. We take the, the length of tau, that's the length of description, and the Kolmogorov complexity is the shortest description. Um, right, so we call a tau like that uh, an m description of, of sigma. Right, so this is formally saying basically the, the Kolmogorov complexity relative to m is the short length of the shortest m description of sigma. Now, of course, there's, there's lots of different machines M, right? So each M gives you a different complexity, uh, but there's some special machines. So U maybe could be this machine that it takes as input a bunch of zeros and then a one and then some, some tau. And what it does is it, so it reads that, it says how many zeros I have, I have N zeros. It finds the nth Turing machine MN and it says, what does MN think about the description tau? So this is uh, what's called a universal machine, right? So for any machine MN, this particular machine U gives descriptions which are longer than MN gave, but they're, they're only N plus one worse, right? You can sort of simulate all the other machines. Um, all right, so a machine like this is it's called universal or optimal. If for every other machine M, there's some constant which depends on this other machine so that the uh, descriptions relative to U, oh, this should be a, a CU here. That should be C's there. So the complexity relative to U, um, it might be bigger than the complexity relative to M, but it's not more than a constant bigger, right? So, so U is as good in terms of the descriptions it gives as any other machine up to a constant. Um, so that's a universal machine, right? It's, it's as good as anything else up to a constant. It might be a little bit worse, but, but it is only a constant. So then we'll fix forever a particular universal machine. And we'll say that the, the plane Kolmogorov complexity uh, of a string sigma is just the complexity relative to this, this particular universal machine. Right? And so this is sort of not totally well defined in the sense that if we choose a different universal machine, right, we'll get a different complexity because they have different descriptions. But if you choose a different universal machine, they're only different up to a constant. So, so up to a constant, this is well-defined, basically. Um, and what that means, right, is, is asking about the Kolmogorov complexity of like a single particular string doesn't really make sense because there's this constant floating around and, and who knows. But if you talk about uh, a whole bunch of strings, like an infinite set of strings, then things do start to make sense. The constant will disappear as the lengths get bigger and bigger, essentially. Right? So it really only makes sense to ask questions that, that don't depend on the constant. Um, this is the idea, right? So, so we're picking like a universal machine and we're saying, what is the shortest description of the string in the universal machine? That's the, that's the Kolmogorov complexity. So um, maybe just your, so if your intuition, I, I did say like we shouldn't talk about particular strings, but we're just gonna talk about particular strings right now. If you have this first string, right? It's got this pattern. It goes one, zero, zero, one, zero, zero, one, zero, zero. This is gonna have relatively low Kolmogorov complexity because you can have a description that says, I'm going to be repeated one zero zero, and so I'm going to do it this many times. All right, it's got some pattern. You can describe the pattern essentially. Uh, if you take like the binary digits of something like pi, this is going to have low Kolmogorov complexity as well, because there's a computer program that can output the the bits, right? And so you can essentially say, you know, I'm the first million bits of pi. That's a description. So that's something that's going to have low Kolmogorov complexity. Uh, on the other hand, this is just some string. I, I got it from just typing random zeros and ones on my computer. Um, it's going to have high Kolmogorov complexity, right? There's, there's no patterns to describe. It's just a random sequence of zeros and ones. Um, so basically, if you, if you do something like if you flip coins heads or tails and you write zeros or ones, almost all the time you're going to get something with high Kolmogorov complexity, something, something very random looking. That's sort of what your intuition should be is like things with patterns, low complexity, things that are random, high complexity. Uh, and then I want to talk about like some, some sort of basic results about uh, complexity, um, which are going to be like the intuition behind these is going to be very important later. So the first thing is there's, there's some constant so that the complexity of any string is at most that length of that string, right? And essentially, so, so the complexity of a string is not more than its length, but that is everything up to a constant. Basically, the reason is that there's a machine that just is the identity, right? So the description of sigma is sigma itself. And that means that the complexity using this machine 
of a string sigma is exactly equal to the length of sigma. And now this is where we bring our universal machine in, right? The universal machine is as good as this machine M we defined up to a constant CM. And so the complexity of sigma, right, with this universal machine is at most the complexity relative to M plus a constant, which is the length of sigma plus a constant. So essentially what we did is to get an upper bound on the complexity of sigma, we made a new machine M, which did something. And then we knew that the universal machine was as good as this machine M up to a constant. Right? So by, by defining our new machine M, we sort of forced the universal machine to do something. So this is gonna be uh, an important tool later. Uh, so another fact is essentially there's, there's incompressible strings. So there's complexity, right? So if we think about like how many strings have complexity less than R, uh, there's a bound on how many of them there can be. And if you count how many strings are there of length less than R, right? You find that, that some strings can't have complexity lower than their length. So why, why is this? Well, basically for each string sigma with complexity less than R, there's some description and that description has length less than R. Each description can only go to one sigma. So we just count how many strings, of, how many descriptions of length less than R are there to go around. Uh, and this is exactly how many. This is how many strings there are of length less than or equal to R. So there's only so many strings that have low complexity, basically. Um, that's going to be different, right? There's the to have low complexity, you have to have a description that's short, and there's only so many short descriptions. Uh, another thing you should think about is so the complexity is not a computable function, right? This this machine U is partial computable. So if you give it a description, it might take a really long time to compute what that description describes, or it might not even halt at all. So what you should think is, is that the Kolmogorov complexity of sigma is like approx dynamically approximable as a decreasing sequence. So essentially what you do is you start looking for descriptions. And every time you find a description that's shorter than every description you have so far, the complexity goes down. And then you look for more descriptions that are even shorter than that, and you find when the complexity goes down again. Right? And then at some point, you won't find any more shorter descriptions, and that'll be the complexity. But you never know if you're done because there could always be more short descriptions that, that show up later. Right? So you should think basically as you find shorter and shorter descriptions, you can see the complexity goes down and eventually it stabilizes at the real complexity. So that's how you should think of like the, the function C is like a dynamically approximable function. Um, right, so, so you can think of C as the, the information content of the string. You can also think of it as measuring the randomness. Um, and then, we talked at the beginning about things being like half random or a quarter random. So if we take the complexity of sigma, homomorphic complexity of sigma, and we divide it by the length of sigma, this is like the amount of randomness per unit length, or the rate of randomness, the information density, something, something like that. Um, how should you think of this, right? Like imagine you create a binary string of like three N, and what you do is you do it by flipping N coins, right? Heads, tails, whatever. And every time you go heads, you put zero, zero, zero. And every time you get tails, you put one, 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 right? So essentially this is gonna be rate of randomness a third because every third bit is completely independent and random. But the other two, like the, so that first bit, right? Every third, but those other two bits are exactly just copying that first one. So they're not random, right? So it's like one third of the bits are random and two thirds of the bits are not random. So you've got rate of randomness about a third. Um, of course, right, you're flipping heads and tails, you might accidentally randomly just get all heads, in which case is not a very random looking sequence. But with very high probability doing this process, you'll get something of rate of randomness uh, a third. Um, this is like a not necessarily a typical example in the sense that the randomness is like very, it's very clear where the randomness is, right? Each, each three bit segment has one random bit and two not random bits. Um, generally, the randomness can be like much more uh, hidden. It can be not just not so obvious where it is. Um, but it's just sort of the simplest example. Uh, but in general, think about it like it's it's more of a holistic thing that like there's some kind of interdependence, but not totally interdependent, and there's some amount of randomness in there. So that's the rate of randomness. That when we say like you're a quarter random or a half random, uh, this is what we mean is is the complexity, Kolmogorov complexity divided by the length. All right, so that's sort of the, the introduction. So now let's talk about uh, what the theorems are about. So maybe the, the first thing is uh, this theorem. Um, 
which says basically that you can boost randomness. So the setup for the entire talk is basically going to be there's a number alpha and a number beta, which are between zero and one. And you're thinking of those as rates of randomness. And the theorem says that there's these functions, there's k functions, uh, gamma one to gamma k. These are the functions that take your longer string and give you a shorter string. Do you think each of the k functions takes a longer string and gives you one of those shorter strings? So you're producing k different short strings. And there's a function f, in this case it's linear, and think of that as telling you what the lengths of the big strings are compared to the lengths of the little strings. Right. So for every sigma, string sigma, of length f of n, that's the bigger strings, if sigma has, right, its rate of randomness is at least alpha, so that's the, right, the complexity is at least alpha times the length, then for some i, one of those k strings that you built, those shorter strings, is going to have length n, and its complexity is going to be at least beta. All right. So what this is saying is that if you want to turn a string of rate of randomness uh, at least alpha into strings of randomness at least beta, you can do it with some number of polynomial time functions, right, and some lengths. So it says that that you can boost the rate of randomness uh, in some way, but it doesn't say anything about like how many functions you need or what the F is or anything like that. But the point is that you can boost the randomness. Um, so maybe just as a picture, right? The idea, you have this, this one string, it's of the longer length, and you're thinking of each of these things giving something of the shorter length, right? And if this one longer string has randomness, rate of randomness at least alpha, then one of these should have rate of randomness at least beta. And again, there's no way of telling which, right? You're just promising that, that something will. And if this, right, if your sigma has randomness less than alpha, so if it's not random enough, then we're not saying anything about those, those tail output strings. All right, so then there's this result. So this says, um, suppose you have something as, as like in the previous theorem, right? You've got these, these k functions, gamma one to gamma k, and you've got this function f, right? Like in the previous theorem, then it says that beta is not going to be too big, right? So this tells you uh, essentially how much you can boost, or at least it gives you a bound of how much you can boost from alpha to, to what beta, given how many functions k, right? So you notice as, as k gets bigger, the right-hand side gets smaller, right? Uh, but it's just, a, it's just a bound. It's not uh, an exact value. So our question is essentially, what's the exact value? What exactly how many, which alphas can you go to which betas with exactly how many functions k? Um, so here's the, the formal definition. Um, so we're going to x to k. So that's, we think of that as like the extractors for k. It's the set of reals alpha and beta where you can boost from alpha rate of randomness to beta rate of randomness using k of those functions gamma. So that's, that's how you should think of it, right? It's the pairs where you can boost from alpha to beta using k functions. So more formally, right, there's a, a total one-to-one -one computable function f that's telling you the lengths. There's these k functions. And there's this constant d, right? Because Kolmogorov complexity is only defined up to a constant, uh, things work out a bit nicer if you sort of allow this, this constant leeway in, in, in things. Um, right? And you're in xk if, if you can boost from alpha to beta, right? So that means that for, for every length n, that's the output string. And for every length string sigma of length f of n, that's the input string, um, all of those output strings are at the right length n. And if that input string is rate of randomness at least alpha, one of those output strings is rate of randomness at least beta. Uh, but also, you know, there's these constants involved as well, right? Which as the strings get longer and longer, the constants sort of disappear. So, uh, right, xk set of string reals a alpha beta, you can go from alpha to beta with k things. So the question essentially is, uh, which strings alpha and beta are in xk, right, for which k? What's the relationship between alpha, beta, and k? Uh, so one thing is, we can immediately say something about f. So suppose that alpha and beta, right, you can go from alpha to beta, and it's witnessed by d and f in these gammas. So one thing is, for, for each i, the complexity of sigma is greater than complexity of the output strings. So the input strings, you can think of as the input string as a description of the output string. 
right? And so up to a constant, the complexity of the input string is bigger than the complexity of the output strings. So essentially, that's, that's saying you can't like make information out of nothing. Information can't be created out of nothing. It has to come from somewhere. Okay, so that's one thing. So the second thing is there are some input strings whose rate of randomness is almost exactly equal to alpha. So it's not more than alpha, it's not less than alpha, it's almost exactly alpha. So it takes some string sigma like this. Now, because this has rate of randomness alpha, right, the procedure has to work. So, so there's some i where gamma of i's complexity is at least beta, right? And then if you put this all together, right, you've got the complexity of sigma, which is equal to alpha, is bigger than the complexity of the gamma at the output. And the output's complexity is at least beta times n, right? So you put it all together, this is what you get. The, the, the f of n has to be linear in n, right? It has to be beta over alpha times n. So essentially, the, right, that's telling the relationship between the input strings and the output strings. The input strings have to be at least beta over alpha times as big as the output strings. That's sort of the, the first relationship we see is, is the lengths. Uh, there's that bound on what they have to be. Um, all right, and then here's the theorem that we'll prove. Um, right, it says exactly when can you go from alpha to beta with k functions. So the first thing is if k is equal to one, right? So that's just the, the case of one function, then you can't do it. You can only go from alpha to beta if alpha is already bigger than beta. So you can't get any increase. But if k is greater than or equal to two, um, then you've got this relation here, um, right? So maybe the first thing to see is that the, right, the uh, so alpha is always less than one. So the numerator is always smaller than the denominator, right? Because essentially what you're doing is you're just taking one of these alphas and switching it to a one. Um, so you can get like a little bit of increase there basically. Um, and I'll show a graph so you can see like exactly what this function looks like. Uh, but moreover, uh, you can get the, the f involved is exactly the f that we saw was the, the smallest possible f that would work. So the, the beta over alpha times n is the f that, that witnesses this. Um, so what does this, what does this look like? So if we take k equals two, uh, this is the graph you get, right? So on the x-axis, you've got the alpha. On the y-axis, you've got the beta, right? And so the point is that the line is, right, you've got the diagonal line, and this line is a little bit above the diagonal. So you can get like really just a little tiny bit of increase with, with only two functions, um, but not a huge increase. Um, and you can't write the dotted line, you can't get the increase right on the line. Uh, it's a strict inequality. And then if you look at different k's, right, as you get more and more functions, you can get more and more of a boost, um, right, all the way up to, you know, in the limit of the states is that you can boost from anything to anything. So, so the more functions you're allowed, uh, the more of a boost in randomness you can get. Uh, and then the slightly related thing. So we said that those functions had to be total, right? So on the input string, you have to always produce k different output strings. You could also ask what happens if they want to be partial. So given the input string, right, you have to produce some output strings, but not necessarily all k of them. Uh, so this is exactly the same definition, except we put a p here for partial, and the k functions are all partial computable functions. And then you can ask, does the things change at all? Uh, and it turns out things almost don't really change. So, uh, right, k equals one, that's the same case. k at least two, this is the same thing as before. Or, right, before you just had the strict inequality, now you can sometimes get the equality, but only if alpha and beta are both computable. So sort of saying along that dotted line now, you can suddenly get the computable points, um, but that's it, All right? So, so it's just like only these computable points along that boundary line are things you can get with, with partial functions. So I guess the point here is, right, partial functions are pretty much no better than just using total functions. I mean, there's just like a little tiny, tiny bit better. All right, so those are the statements. So now I want to talk about a bit about the proof, and the proof goes through this, this cool connection with graphs. Um, so I want to sort of explain, I'm not going to actually give the proof, but I want to explain where that connection comes from um, and how looking at graphs helps you solve the problem. So suppose that you can boost from alpha to beta with k functions, right? And that you've got this d, this f, and these gammas that witness this. So out of these, you can build a k hypergraph, uh, right, for each n. So there's a, a sequence of graphs 
the vertices of the graphs are the strings of length n. So these were the strings that were the length of the output functions. The edges are going to think of as the strings that were the input functions, the bigger length. And an edge, which is like an input string, is incident on those k different outputs. Right. So essentially, you're thinking of inputs as edges, and an input is has as its vertices all of its different outputs. And on the other hand, you can go back the other way too. So if you have a, a k hypergraph and it's got the right amount of vertices and the right amount of edges, then you can think of the vertices as being strings of length n. And you can think of the edges as being strings of length f of n, right, up to some bijection. And given one of those edges, right, think of it as an edge. It's this, of course, it's the length of an input string. You say, what are its output strings? Well, its output strings are those k vertices that it's incident on. Um, and I'm going to be a little bit fuzzy about like whether an edge is allowed to have multiple copies of the same vertex on it, or whether these gammas can give different function, different values from each other, whether they can give the same value. Um, but you can sort of all make sense of that, like just, just change back and forth, essentially. It doesn't really matter. But essentially, you think of an edge as mapping to the vertices. Right. So this gives you a way to go back and forth between these gamma functions and these hypergraphs. Um, and, and so that's that's sort of moving the gammas into a hypergraph. And then let's think about what the condition, right? So, so being able to boost from alpha to beta using the gammas, what does that mean? That means that for every string of the longer length with its complexity at least alpha, then there's some i where the one of those gammas gives you something with complexity at least beta, right? And in the hypergraphs, that means that for every edge, if that edge has rate of randomness at least alpha, then one of its vertices has rate of randomness at least beta, right? Because the edges are mapping to their vertices. So, so if the edge has at least alpha, at least one vertex has to be at least beta. Or equivalently, like, right, if you flip it around, that says that if every single vertex on one edge has rate of randomness less than beta, then that edge has to have randomness less than alpha. So if every vertex has randomness less than beta, on an edge, that edge has to be less than alpha. So uh, we're going to think dynamically, right? So we're going to play the part of a machine M, and we're going to be assigning descriptions to strings. Um, and remember, the idea is that there's a we're playing this machine M. We're choosing what M does, but there's this universal machine that has to copy us, and right? it has to be at least as good as us up to some constant. So when we playing M assign a short description using M to a string tau. Uh, right, that makes the the universal machine has to assign a short description also, but it's allowed to be a little bit longer, right? C longer, but when we assign a short description, the universal machine has to also assign a short description. So by playing the machine M, we can make the complexity of tau small. Now we've got a description, a, a restriction, right? We can't assign the same description to two different strings, and we only have a, a restricted number of strings of lengths of each size, right? We've got one description of length zero, We've got two descriptions of size one, four of size two, and so on. So we're limited in, in what we have available to, to assign. So we're going to think of ourselves as assigning short descriptions to vertices, right? And remember the condition boosting from alpha to beta meant that if every vertex on some edge has a short description, right, has low complexity, then the edge has to have low complexity. So that means is whenever we give a short description, and by short I mean you know a size uh, smaller than than alpha f of n of every vertex of an edge. Whenever we do that, right, the universal machine has to give a short description to the edge. So if we cover an edge, all the vertices with short descriptions, the edge has to get a short description also. So we're going to sort of play a game, right, where we're going to start coloring these vertices. So. Right. Maybe we say we're going to give a short description to this guy, right? And then we're going to give a short description to this guy. And because we've given short descriptions to both of those uh, vertices, we're going to think of like we have an opponent, right? Who's who's trying to make sure that this works, that you can boost from alpha to beta. He, our opponent, has to give a short description to that edge. And now, if we give a short description to say this vertex, our opponent's going to have to give a short description not only to this edge, but also to this edge. 
right? Because those are edges where both of the vertices have short descriptions. And then again, if we give a short description to say this vertex. Our opponent's going to have to give a short description to this edge and to that edge, right? So we've been kind of smart here in that we've chosen a small number of edges, right? Because remember, we only have so many short descriptions. We can only give so many vertices short descriptions. But we've been smart in that we've chosen edges or vertices that have a lot of edges between them, right? So we've gotten like the most bang for our buck in terms of making our opponent take actions. So that's sort of the picture is, is we're coloring the vertices, right? We're giving them short descriptions. And our opponent's giving short descriptions to all those edges that show up. So if we think of a set U of vertices, E of U is the number of hyper edges that, that are entirely between those vertices. Right. So if we give short descriptions to all the vertices in a set U, our opponent, right, this universal machine, has to give short descriptions to all the edges in E of U. Right. In order to make this condition that, that you actually do go from alpha to beta work out. So we're limited in the number of short descriptions that we have uh, that we can assign to vertices. So I think I, I mixed that up, right? We're assigning, so we're limited in the number of short descriptions we can assign to vertices. The universal machine is limited in the number of short descriptions it can assign to edges, right? And the bigger alpha is, the more descriptions we have available. The bigger beta is, the more uh, short descriptions the universal machine has available. We're essentially playing this game where we're trying to run the opponent out of short descriptions using our short descriptions. And the more edges there are, right, in this, in this set U, the more edges there are, the harder it is for our opponent, right? If there's too many edge, is they're going to run out of short descriptions. But of course, we're limited on how big we can make U, right? So we want to make E of U as big as possible for the number of vertices in U. So that's the sort of dynamic picture of this game that we're going to play. Is we're trying to trying to run someone out of short descriptions using our short descriptions. So you've got to count precisely, right? There's there's a certain number of short descriptions that we have, a certain certain number of short descriptions they have, right? They have to do all the counting. How many? How do they match up? But after doing all that, uh, what you get is this term, which gives you this equivalence, um, right? So it says that you can boost from alpha to beta with k functions, if and only if there's a function f witnessing this, which of course uh, we'll find out, right, it, it can be exactly this, uh, such that there's a sequence of K hypergraphs, GN, right? They have the right number of vertices and the right number of hyper edges to make that, that correspondence earlier work. But they also have this property that uh, for every set U of vertices, with U not too big, the number of edges that are entirely contained within U is also not too big, All right? So, so it's a condition, right? This is a purely graph theoretic thing about, uh, right? Do these graphs actually exist? Uh, and it's about sort of the distribution of the edges. And if you think about it, right? It's saying that the edges aren't like too badly distributed, right? Because what, what could go wrong that would make this not happen is if you had a small set of, of vertices and there were a lot of edges between those vertices. So that's like a, a concentration of edges. So this is saying basically you can go from alpha to beta if there are graphs where the edges are kind of well spread out among the entire graph. Um, of course, like there's some numbers, exactly how well spread out does it have to be, right? That all comes from exactly doing, doing the exact count. But, but the way you should think of it, right, is, is an extractor from going from alpha to beta is like a, a well-distributed graph, which is well-distributed with parameters alpha and, and beta. So, okay, so how do you how do you decide exactly which alpha and beta are, are have Kolmogorov extractors? Well, you just ask the, this graph theoretic question, right? You say, can I actually build these graphs or can I not build these graphs, right? For which alpha and beta can I actually get these graphs? And that's a purely graph theoretic question, uh, right? There's like no computability involved in it. <laughs> so last thing I wanna talk about is a bit about how you look at that kind of question. So it's a question about like edge distribution in graphs. Right, so we've reduced the question to asking, uh, for which alpha and beta uh, is there a function f of n, right, and, and the graph with the right vertices, the right edges, and this, this edge distribution condition. So that's purely graph theoretic. So the way you should think of this is, is there's, in a graph, there's an edge density, which is the 
ratio of edges that you actually have to the amount of potential edges, right? So if you think of like a, a, a graph, just a normal graph, not a hypergraph, so like a two hypergraph, right? For every pair of vertices, that's a potential edge. So you're saying, how many vertices do you have over how many pairs of vertices, right? So in a K hypergraph, it's the number of edges that you have divided by the number of vertices, choose K, right? So you choose each K set of vertices is a potential edge. How many of those are there? So if the edges were completely evenly distributed, right, then you'd expect if you had a set of vertices U. How many edges should it have? Well, you say, how many potential edges does U have? That's the size of U choose K. And then you multiply it by the ratio, right, the, the edge density. So it'd be P times the size of U choose K edges. This is like what you would expect if the edges were completely well distributed. Uh, but it's not always the case that, that it's like exactly totally evenly distributed. Any graph is going to have some sets that have slightly more uh, edges than they should have. So maybe the, the most extreme example of this is Ramsey's theorem, right? It says if you have a very, very big graph and you're looking at very, very small sets U, then you're always going to be able to find a set U that either contains every possible edges or no edges at all, right? So this is the most extreme case. Like you could have a graph that has edge density a half, so it has half the edges. But there's some sets U that have edge density one or some sets U that have edge density zero. So, so the edge density could be very, very different. Um, there's a paper we found by uh, Erdos and some other people, which studies the case when you've got a, a big graph, but U is also very, very big, something like half the vertices, right? And then you look at exactly how many, how concentrated can the vertices get into U. Uh, our case, right, if you think about it, what was the uh, right? What was the size of u? Well, there were two to the n vertices, and the size of u was about two to the beta n. So that's our case, right? U is like a power of the total number of vertices. So you can think if if it's like half, then this is like a square root of the total number of vertices. So this is kind of an intermediate case between this this Ramsey's theorem move between the Erdos case. Um, and in our case, we can get them to be really quite evenly distributed, right? So it's, it's always possible to find, and, and this is the general idea is in, in all of these cases, right? It's always possible to find some set U that has slightly more than the expected number of edges, right? That you can concentrate the edges a little bit, but there's graphs where it's not too much more. Um, so essentially like the, I mean, if you're thinking of this as, as, as parameterized by N, the size of the graph, right? The, the extra amount of edges you can get is a lower order term compared to just the main term. So the, the amount of extra edges you can get is like only this little tiny, tiny bit extra. Um, how do you prove this? Well, the main tool for these kinds of problems is the probabilistic method. So for example, how do you find out there's a graph where the edges aren't uh, well distributed, or sorry, are very well distributed, right? So basically what you do is you say, I have a certain edge density that I want. Right, I want say 50% of the edges. So I'm just going to flip a coin for each edge. And if it's heads, I'm going to put an, an edge. Tails, I'm going to not put an edge. And then you say, what's the probability? If I do this, what's the probability that I get a graph where, where the edges are very well evenly distributed? And it turns out the probability is greater than zero. Right? So there is some chance that you're going to get a very well distributed graph. And then you say, aha, you know. In order for that to happen, there must be such graphs must exist. So, so essentially, a, a, a random graph is going to have some possibility of being very well distributed. Um, and it's actually both ways. So, so to see that there's some sets u with slightly more than the expected number of edges, that's also by the probabilistic method. Right? Essentially, you think of picking random sets u, and you show that it's very unlikely that they all have the expected number of edges. So, so both ways, right, showing that you, you can be quite well distributed, but not too well. Both of those use the, the probabilistic method. And then, right, so, so you basically you say exactly, right, uh, you figure out the exact parameters for this, right? Exactly how well distributed can you be? You feed it back in to that theorem that said, you know, the, the equivalence of being, uh, having, going from alpha to beta and of having these graphs exist, right? If you feed the parameters back in, uh, then you arrive at, at these theorems here, right? Which say uh, exactly when can you go from alpha to beta, right? So the, just to sort of recap, right? The, the general strategy 
was you said, going from alpha to beta, that's equivalent to there being certain graphs, right? And that was this game that you play where we give short descriptions and the opponent gives short descriptions and, and we try to run them out of short descriptions. Right. So, so there's that equivalence with this pure graph theoretic thing. And then you figure out exactly how distributed can you make the graphs. Uh, and then you have to follow the parameters all the way through, right? And then that gives you uh, this exact equation it just sort of falls out of all of that. I think that's kind of cool that, um, right, this thing that's this sort of this very dynamic looking thing, right? And that was that, that movement from this question to the graph question is a very dynamic movement. It was all about, uh, you know, giving short descriptions, dynamic, that kind of argument. But then you turn it into this question that's now solved by the probabilistic method in a very static kind of way. Uh, and I think that's like a really cool character. It also shows, I think, how to, how to think about Kolmogorov complexity in this sort of dynamic way. Um, right? And this is a kind of a typical argument in the sense that, that a lot of these arguments use this dynamic kind of structure uh, where you think of like giving short descriptions while someone else is giving short descriptions and you play yourself off against them. Uh, and so I think that's really cool. But then it moves to this, this cool graph theory question. Um, so that's it. Uh, I'll leave these uh, the theorem statements up, but thanks for listening. Uh, thanks for having me. Are there any questions? Uh, I have a question. Okay. Um, okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay, yeah. So um, by effective, I assume you mean computable, but then yeah. you talk about running out of descriptions. If you're actually looking at short descriptions, that looks like it's not computable. So uh, first off, is effective mean computable? Yeah, effective means computable. Okay, then how do you manage to sort of run out, how do you manage to look at short descriptions? That, that sounds not computable to be looking at, so to speak, short descriptions. Uh, so essentially what we're doing, so when we assign a short description, right, what we're doing is we're saying, here's a string, and I, I'm defining this machine M, right? M is the machine interpreting the description. And, and essentially what I do is I pick this description that I want to assign, and I say M is going to output like the thing I'm describing using that short description. Uh, so I guess I'm like you're you're running this construction effectively. If that makes sense. Well, but uh, but isn't the, but the UTM is actually partial recursive, so you keep waiting for it to halt. So how do you get around that? Uh, so are you talking about um, just a second? Like this sort of stage here? Yeah. Or? Yeah. 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 So so so. The machine M is something we're building, right? Okay. Um, so we 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 sort of like. So so essentially, what we do is is we've got this sequence of graphs, right? Which is a computable sequence, and we're playing this game in there where we give we, we sort of look for a set U that we want to assign short descriptions to, and we're not we don't even have to watch the universal machine, right? The universal machine is going to have to copy us. Because we are we are a Turing machine, right? So the universal machine must copy us. And I guess that's sort of the power, right? Is that he has to watch us, but we don't have to watch him. Okay. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. Any more questions? So, Matthew, so very speculatively, given that you translated this um, or complexity computability theory question, the graph theoretic question, right? Is there any hope that one could go backwards in some cases and use common graph complexity to prove graph theoretic facts? Yeah, I, guess, I mean, I guess the question is like, you'd have to prove the common graph complexity theorem without using the same argument as the graph theory. I don't know if that's possible. Like without just sort of hiding the, the same argument we'd have to use. So there's, there's one interesting thing, which is, um, right, so, so this one was polynomial time functions. And, and essentially if you translate that through, then you get some kind of like polynomial time version. So I know, um, Right, right. All these questions for graphs, when you talk about like polynomial time things, are very, very hard. Right. These questions about um, like Ramsey theory, Ramsey numbers and stuff, but trying to do it in polynomial time. Like they don't have polynomial time built counter examples and stuff. So that's something that, but I guess they also don't have, uh, right. This isn't like at the, the right bounds, I guess. So that's a connection to 
because that's a question, a connection of two open problems. More questions? If not, let's thank the speaker once more.